There are times that I wish that I could uh, give you a little glimpse inside my odd and weird little mind. But as I sit here this morning and, and I listen to what we're singing and I know what I'm about to preach about and I, and I listen to your stories, it, I, I, I can't even put it in words. The message, the message that, that we, we taught at children's camp this year is the same message that a brother is teaching right now on the other side of the world sitting in a concrete building with a dirt floor, eating his utensils for eating his meal is a piece of bread that you scoop it up, no forks, knives, spoons. It's the message that we're gonna preach right here this morning. It's the same gospel. And no matter, <coughs> excuse me, no matter what the situation is that we find ourselves in, it's the same gospel that's the answer to all of it. And it just sounds so, and, and, and I just wish I could let you in on that little moment of, this is the coolest thing ever. This is absolutely the coolest thing ever. That I get to stand up and give you a truth that I know, that I know, that I know is truth. And that no matter where you are and what you're doing, this is the answer. This is it. It's just cool. So, enough preamble. Tuesday's election day. If you thought I was going to let that get by and not mention that you're crazy. If you haven't voted yet, you need to get out and go vote. There are a million reasons I've heard people tell me they're not going to vote or shouldn't vote. There's a million reasons I've heard Christians tell me that they're not going to vote. I'm telling you every one of them are not valid. If you're a Christian in America, you have a duty to vote. And you have a duty to vote Christian. Now, what does it look like to vote Christian? Well, we're in 1 Corinthians. We've been talking about voting Christians, Christians since 1 Corinthians 1. Paul has reminded us of what we need to know in order to vote Christian in order to live Christian, in order to eat Christian, in order to go to school Christian, in order to go to work Christian, he's been reminding of this over and over and over again. First thing he started was with was, God wants us to flourish. God wants us to flourish. Now, how does that tell me how to vote? How does, how does that even fit into me voting? Well, we look at the scripture, we go to 1 Timothy 2, which you all know because we, we taught through 1 Timothy, so you all know that like the back of your hands now. Timothy says in chapter 2, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high places, that we may lead a peaceful life and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So what does it look like in God's eyes for you and me to flourish? Well, according to this, it means that we live a peaceful life, a quiet life, a godly life, and a dignified life. He just lays it out here for us. This is how we flourish. And in America, to have kings and people in high places that will facilitate us being able to live a peaceful, quiet life, godly and dignified in every way, then we must vote because we are the government. We are the government. We the people. Remember that phrase? A government, was it, was it Lincoln? Oh, Randy's off the top of his head. This is so dangerous. <laughs> government for, of, and by the people? It's us. It's not Atlanta, it's not Washington, D.C., it's us. And for us to have a world that we can live in that's peaceable, that's peaceable and quiet so we can live a godly and dignified life, it is up to us to vote, to vote Christian. 
Secondly, Paul reminds us that God saved us. And thirdly, he reminds us that being saved changes everything. It changes how we think. It changes how we act. We are no longer merely human. We are no longer just part of a crowd. We are changed. We are different. Everything about us changes. Therefore, everything we do should be impacted by that. We should make ourselves stop and think, what does it look like? to vote Christian in this election. Fourth, Paul reminds us that we have everything we need to follow Jesus. There's nothing hidden. You haven't got to know anything more special than that. Fifth, he reminds us that we were saved by the power of the cross, by the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's why we keep preaching the gospel over and over and over again. It is what saves us and it is what gives us our power. And because of this cross, what Paul is going to remind us today in this scripture is because we know the cross, we have the spirit, and since we have the spirit, we have the mind of Christ, and since we have the mind of Christ, we know how to live, and by extension, we know how to vote because we have the spirit of God in us. Our main point for today is the last part of verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 16 that says, but we have the mind of Christ. But we have the mind of Christ. So open your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 6. If you're joining us by live stream today, we want to thank you very much for joining the First Baptist Church of Gray, Georgia. Thank you for being a part of our worship. If you live in Jones County or the surrounding area, we'd love for you to be here with us if you can. And if you can't, thank you for joining us. And we hope that you'll open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 16 as well. Follow along with us because whether you're at camp or whether you're overseas in a foreign country or like Austin is in England right now or whether you're in this sanctuary in Jones County, this is God's word. Hear now the word of the Lord. Yet among the mature, we do not impart, we do impart, let's get this right. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly to them and he is not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Now, if you're reading through this passage really, really fast, you're just reading through it to get it read, it's real easy to miss the point that Paul's trying to make in this thing. Phrases like, among the mature and secret and hidden wisdom have opened the doors for people to say and do some really wacky things. One of the things that people will say is, well, the Bible is just too hard for me to understand. It has secret and hidden wisdom. That is not what this text means. Also, when people get this, there are certain people who claim to be more mature than the rest of us, and they've plumbed the depths of the secret and hidden mysteries of God, the wisdom of God, 
And often when they do that, have you ever noticed when these guys plumb the depths and learn so much that it almost always requires you to buy one of their books? You know, attend one of their conferences? Isn't that amazing when they've done that? Or maybe it even gets so extreme that you've got to drink their Kool-Aid or you've got to live in their compound. It's not what this text is saying either. Paul says three things with these verses. First, as Christians, listen to me. I, just, I, I, I know I, I come in this morning dreading this because I know that I'm going to say it and that the majority of us is just going to go, Foom. And we're going to walk out. And we're going to leave. But I want you to hear this. And I want you to understand it. And I want you to take this to heart. We're living in a world that has a lot of people saying a lot of things about a lot of things. And a lot of things that they're saying a lot of things about are saying that we don't know what we're talking about. That we are out of sync with the world. We're out of sync with time. We're out of sync with society. We just don't have it together with everybody else. And what Paul is telling us right here is this. We know what we're talking about. Let's do a Pentecostal thing this morning. I'm going to say this and I want y'all to repeat it back to me. All right? See it in the Pentecostal churches all the time. We know what we're talking about. Oh, y'all did that better than I expected. Let's do it again. A little more gusto. We know what we're talking about. And you do, you do, that's good. Okay, number one, we know what we're talking about. Number two, we're gonna talk about this is how we know what we're talking about. And number three, this is why we do what we do, all right? We know what we're talking about. Verse six says, yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Now why Paul says it that way, and the way I emphasize that, because I believe that's exactly how he's saying this in his mind, we do impart wisdom. Remember we said that Paul himself said, we're not telling tales on Paul, Paul himself says, I am not eloquent. I didn't come to you guys with all this great wisdom. I'm not Jordan Peterson or all these people that do these great talks that everybody's in awe. When they hear me speak, they're just, they say that I don't sound very good. I come to them in weakness. I don't have lofty speech or wisdom. But just because I'm a country hick doesn't mean that I don't know what I'm talking about. Among the mature, I do impart wisdom. Now, is this him being given a snide put down? If you were mature, you'd know what I'm saying. Obviously, I'm not the bumpkin you are. That's not what he's doing. He's saying... The word mature here that he keeps using simply means saved. That's all it means. A mature person is a person who is saved. Now, is he saying that they're not saved? No, he's not saying that at all. What he's saying to them and what he is saying to us here in Gray, Georgia, and wherever you're watching on live stream, what he's saying to this, us is, you're not listening. You're not listening. We are distracted. We're listening to Pelosi and Schumer and McConnell and Biden and Trump and Bolsonaro and Lula, North Korea, South Korea, Russia, the Ukraine, this is this week. Syria, Iran, Israel, Netanyahu, the Fed, inflation, crime statistics, abortion, LGBTQ, transgender, drag queen story hour, on and on and on. If we were playing Jeopardy, and you know, in Jeopardy, they give you the answer and you have to give them the question. Verse six is the answer. The correct question would be, why are you listening to them? Why are you listening to them? Their wisdom is of this age. Why are you trying to make sense out of what they're saying? They rule with the wisdom of this age. Why would you let that affect how you live your life, Christian? Paul says, they are doomed to pass away. 
And I'm just, I'm in there with the rest of you. I see this and I listen to them, I talk, and I think the world's coming to an end, and this is the greatest election of all time, and the entire, the entire galaxy is going to fall apart if you don't vote correctly in this one. I mean, I, it wouldn't surprise me if the earth didn't just explode. Boom, we're all dead. Just knock that, boom, gone. If you don't vote right. And don't vote right means you don't vote Democrat. Oh, and you don't vote Republican, or you don't vote Independent, or you... Why are we listening? Verse 7 says, but we impart a secret and wisdom, hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. What is the secret and hidden, the hidden wisdom of God? This is what you know. Before the ages, God the Father purposed in his heart that he was going to send Jesus to be our Savior. That's the hidden wisdom. That's the hidden wisdom. That's what he's saying. He did it before the ages, before time, before creation. Why? Why? Why did he send Jesus? Why did he send Jesus? Was it because he didn't want heaven without us? Is that what it is? Well, that couldn't possibly be. Because see, God's complete. He's whole. There's nothing in him to want anything. He's completely self-sustaining. He's completely self-satisfied. So why did he send Jesus? He sent Jesus for our glory. For our glory, we were created in the image of God to reflect the glory of God. And when we were saved, what did we do? We started to reflect the glory of God and we bask in that glory. Now that's really high-minded, so let's bring it down so it's a practical thing. How does this work? What are some of the ways that you experience the glory of God? What are some of the ways that you experience the glory of God? John 11, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, he said. One of my best friends in college, I don't think he would even know that I considered him my best friend. We had such a short period of time together. But I just fell in love with this guy and his wife died this week. Wife died of cancer, 45 years of marriage. And she's not here anymore, but she's not gone. And my brother, who's a chaplain in the United States Army, a retired chaplain in the United States Army, he knows and he hangs on to that with everything he's got. Do you know what? She didn't die. Mama just moved. And I'm coming along. Mr. Bentley is laying in Lynn Haven nursing home right now, staring through eyes that probably haven't blinked for two days. His face, y'all know, y'all know the look. His face is sunken in, his mouth is open. His head's back a little bit. He's kind of in a fetal position just a little bit. And you look at it and you go, this is horrible, this is terrible. And at the same time, he is going home. He's about to be in a place that we try to describe and we can't. And he's going to see it. And in a little while, we're going to see it before you know it. Matthew 6 says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is life not worth more? Is life not worth more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to your lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, all of his glory, wearing his royal kingly robes, was not arrayed like one of them. So if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O little, you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. He says. It's kind of an if-then, isn't it? If 
you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all of these things will be added to you. Therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. And to kick into my King James, because that's how I memorized this last little part. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In other words, every day's bad enough. Don't go borrowing from tomorrow. Just deal with today. Those of you who are mature, who are saved and not distracted, we believe this. We believe this. And the crazy thing is, is we get all wrapped up into everything else and every one of us in here does it, get distracted by everything in the world and then something pulls us back and the Lord says, to bask in my glory, what you need to do is rest in me and follow me and we will take care of this thing. That's what he's saying. If we seek him first, this is important. It changes how you make your decisions. Paul's saying, remember this. Paul's saying to the Christians of Corinth and to the Christians of Jones County in middle Georgia, remember this. You know what the world is selling you and you know that it's wrong, don't you? They don't trust Jesus. They don't understand. They crucify Jesus every single day with their wisdom, but you know Jesus. Jesus. <clears throat> Excuse me. And here's the $64,000 question. How can you be so sure you know? How come you're not just being dogmatic? How do you know that you know that you know? This is how we know. Verses 9 through 13. This is how we know. Verse 9. But as it is written, what no eye has seen nor I ear heard, nor heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Paul's quoting, if you go looking for it, you're not going to find this exact quote in the Old Testament, but this exact quote is used in several different authors of this time period who are all Jewish, who all point back to something that was based on Old Testament, but, but has been expanded. And now it's used in this scripture. So it's the word of God. All right. So if you're looking for an exact one and somebody says, see, you can't find that in there, you go, yeah, okay, whatever. Who can know the mind of God? It's a rhetorical question because you know what the answer is, nobody. Nobody can know the mind of God, right? Except these things God has revealed to us through his spirit. People who live by the wisdom of this age cannot see or hear or imagine what God has prepared for us. That's why they act crazy and you can't make sense out of what they're doing. That's why they can lie to you with impunity and they look like they're believing what they're saying and you're knowing that they're lying and it's how you know that. Because they can't know this wisdom. They can guess. They can tell us their opinions. They'll even take the Bible and contort the Bible to say all kinds of things that God wants. I don't know if you've paid any attention to the politicians, but it seems like when it's convenient, they all can quote scripture. Have you noticed that? Even the ones of them that I, well, whoo, thank you. Pulled that one back. <laughs> Let's just say this about that. Every one of them can quote scripture. Every last one of them. But unless the scripture has been revealed by the spirit, it's garbage. They can't, they're just using words. For the spirit searches everything. He's making a case here. Everything is everything. There is nowhere the spirit goes, can't go. Even the depths of God. His argument here is this. Here's his argument. His argument is the Holy Spirit is God, right? Right? Holy Spirit's God. Being God, he is unbounded by power, he is unbounded by knowledge, and he's unbounded by place. He can do anything, know anything, and go anywhere he wants to go because he's God. So the Holy Spirit searches everything, including the depths of God, every nook and every cranny. And in verse 11, Paul might as well have asked you this question, who knows what you're thinking? Who knows what you're thinking? I'm standing here right now going, what are, what are they thinking? Who in here is thinking about, well, as soon as I leave here, I'm going to sit in that line at Jack's, going to take way too long, but the chicken strips aren't so bad. <laughs> Who's thinking what? I don't know what you're thinking. 
I don't know what you're thinking. That's what he's asking you. Who knows what you're thinking? And he wants you to answer, well, the only person that knows what I'm thinking is me. And so now he builds his next step and he says, so if that's the case, who's the only person that knows the mind of God? Well, that would have to be God, who the Holy Spirit is God, would know the mind of God, and now you've received the Holy Spirit because you're saved, and now guess what you have? You have the Holy Spirit living in you who knows the mind of God. So therefore, you know, you understand the things freely given to us by God. In verse 13, Paul says, it's the Holy Spirit speaking in your spirit, spiritual truths. That's how you know. That's how you know. I mentioned the other week, (coughs) excuse me, mentioned the other week, Some of us have said, you've said, I've said, God spoke to us. We didn't hear an audible voice, but we knew. And here's the answer how. God's spirit speaking into our spirit. And people who are not Christians think you have lost your mind. That doesn't make good sense. It's craziness. In fact, they're afraid of it. Just listen to the political rhetoric. Evangelicals want to create a theocracy. We want to take away women's rights. We want to oppress anybody that's not like us. We are hateful. We are bigoted. We are homophobic. We are transphobic. We are narrow-minded. We are anti-science. We are anti-education. We are ignorant. We are buffoons. Did I make that up? Or have you not seen that on television and somebody saying that or on social media somewhere? Why do they say that? Why do they have that hate? The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for those things are folly to him. They're craziness. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. They do not have the Spirit of God. They can't understand them. The only thing they can do is fight them. And that's what they're doing. And we get all, what? I learned that in seminary, it's a theological term. Ah! Last two verses. The spiritual person judges all things. Y'all listen to that and take it to heart. And don't let people mess with your mind on that word judges. Don't, that's just, don't do that. Just don't do that. Spiritual person judges all things but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The spiritual person judges all things. Now y'all, we've talked about this a million times. Let me do it one more time. Young people take this to heart. This is an, this is an argument that people wanna use all the time. The Bible says these people that don't know Jesus will quote scripture to you and say, your Bible says judge not, so that you don't judge, or King James is the way I remembered it. Judge not, lest thou be judged. That's what they tell you. You're not supposed to judge people. Let me help you understand that. No, you're not supposed to look at somebody and say, he's going to hell. Not supposed to do that. Not supposed to do that, because I don't know. The Lord can do anything. People pass away, maybe in the last 30 seconds of life, they get right with the Lord. I don't know. Not my job. I don't need to worry about that. But the Bible says over and over and over again, and this word right here says you need to examine everything. You examine everything. Everything. You discern everything. And that's what he's saying right here. He's saying that you examine all things in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You examine all things in the light of the fact that you were saved by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Everything you come in contact with. So how does that work with voting? Let me tell you how it works with me. I will not vote for someone who is pro-abortion, period. I don't care who they are. I don't, care, I don't care if they're Republican, I don't care if they're Democrat, I don't care if they're independent, I don't care. I don't care. And you can tell me, because I had a politician tell me this once, I don't believe in it, however, I'm with this party, and so I'm, I'm in this party. And I told them that as long as you're in that party, 
You lay down with dogs, you're gonna get fleas. I'm sorry, it's the old man stuff in me. No, I will not vote for you. Why? Because the Lord gave me Psalm 139, 13, for I formed my inward part, for you formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. An unborn baby is the work of God. Exodus 20, 13 says you shall not murder. That means that you don't spill innocent blood. Psalm 127, 4 says like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Children are a blessing from God. John 6, 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is the bread of God. He came to give life. He did not come to take it. Therefore, I will not vote for you, period. Quote me anything else you want to quote me. I'll take you right back. Because we are supposed to take what the world says and you are supposed, you, listen, listen, you who think that you're not the smartest tool in the shed, and I think that applies to probably everybody in this room. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. You are supposed to examine what you hear using the cross of Jesus Christ and make your decision on that. You decide what is right and wrong based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you do that? Do you do that? I've told you before, the, 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 the thing that somebody I talked to said on college campus, said, Dad, all of these folks, I just gave away who it was, didn't I? Dad, all these folks that are in the same sex relationships look as happy as everybody else does. If I didn't know what the Lord said in Scripture, I would think it was fine. There's a lot of people telling you a lot of things are fine. And I'm telling you from this Scripture in in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that Paul is saying, you have the mind of Christ. You've been saved by the cross of Jesus Christ. His blood spilled, saved you. His resurrection has given you eternal life. You can know what's right and wrong. Judge it, live by it. Not saying what would Jesus do. I'm saying what does the Lord say about this? What is his wisdom? And when you say his wisdom, there are people who are going to howl about it, but that doesn't matter because the spiritual person is examined by nobody. Do you understand what he's saying? When all these people start saying that you're the crazy one, you just walk away because you go, I know better. I'm not the crazy one. Because if I'm crazy, that means God's crazy. And if God's crazy, boy, we're in a mess. This ain't going to end very good. The spiritual person is examined by nobody. Is examined by no one. The world can't tell you, the, is, tell you you are wrong. So why does that even matter? The profane person, Gordon Fee says, the profane person cannot understand holiness. But the holy person can well understand the depths of of evil and you can see their evil and you know how what they teach and how they practice is an affront to God and God's order you know it you see it they can't see it all they can do is fuss about it who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him or to put it another way who who is the person who wants to match wits with God who's smart enough to do that Well, you remember Job? Remember Job shaking his fist at God saying, listen, you've done a lot of bad stuff here. I don't get it. I've lived right. I've lived good. I'm kind of confused by all this. Get yourself down here and have a talk with me. And he said that several times to God until God finally came back in Job 38. He says, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Where would you, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Where were you when I made the sea and the clouds? Have your eyes seen where dead people go? 
Tell me how much it's going to snow this year. Tell me how much rain we're going to get a week from next Thursday. Can you stop the stars in the sky? Can you feed all of the wild beasts? He does this for four chapters. And finally, Job comes back and he says, I know that you can do all things. And that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. How did Job gain his wisdom? He had heard of him. He knew him by education, but now my eyes see you. Now he knows him by experience. And that's Paul's point. We have the mind of Christ. So what does that even mean? It means that the spirit searches everything, even the mind of God. That spirit speaks to the spirit of everybody who is saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. The spirit of truth has come. The spirit of truth speaks to your spirit and teaches you how Jesus thinks about things, and because of that, you do know what to do. Have some confidence. Don't trust yourself. Trust the Spirit. He will guide you. I've learned sometimes you just got to start walking. And if you're walking in the wrong direction, I have found out every time the Lord will slap you and put you in the right one. Every single time. Trust the Lord. We know how to live, we know how to vote. We know how to do whatever we need to do because we have the mind of Christ. Have you got it? All right. That's enough for today. Let's pray. Father, please, please. Lord, we have Christians that I know myself included, all of us, we've been on defense for so long. I feel like we have to defend ourselves against everybody and everything that people are saying. And, and you're telling us in this word not to defend ourselves and not to be on the offense, simply to live and to know and to trust you to guide us every minute of every day. Lord, can you, can you blast that into our hearts? Cause us to remember this this week when we're, when we're places that we're challenged, when we're at work and, and the upper echelons are wanting us to, to say and do things that are against our faith. And when we're at school and, and people are saying and doing things and, and we know these things are against our faith, show us, show us how to be delivered through that. How we are to act knowing that we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. That we're different. We are made new. Help us to see it. Lord, I pray for this election that's coming up. I pray that the world doesn't explode. Lord, I know who I want to win, but I want more than anything that who you have ordained to be in power. Your word tells us that you choose kings and princes, that you put them there and that the lessons that need to be learned are learned. Lord, I would pray that things would become a little easier again for our children and our grandchildren's sake. But also know that it's trials that cause us to have perseverance. And perseverance is what gives us character. I sure don't see much character anymore. 
Help us, Father. Help us, help us, help us. I believe, Father, that unless you open the eyes of a person, they cannot be saved. That unless you speak to their heart and show them that you are there, they will never see. Your word rings in my ears, seeing they don't see, hearing they don't hear. Father, I pray this morning that for those in our congregation who do not see and do not hear, that you would wake up their dead souls and give them a glimpse of you that they would know they need to follow you. Please, Father, raise up many to follow you for your glory so that the world may say, this is a God who loves his people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, as we sing, I invite you to come down, see me after the service, whatever, but let's talk. And church, walk out of here today with some head back just a little bit more. The Lord tells you, you know what to do. Do it in his name. Stand together and sing.